This is the body of Christ. And it's more than just being broken. It's also learning. And, and I think, um, and this is so timely because uh, I talked to Pastor Scheller the other day and we, we talked even about this. Um, that it's about serving one another. It's about serving one another. I think we find um, everything that's empty within us, we find it when we serve. We find Christ when we serve the body of Christ. This is the purpose of Christ saying, I will build my church. For within that church, we're going to be this amazing vessel which has an amazing fragrance and sometimes it's never broken. Sometimes it's held. Oh, I'll hold that back for another time. I'll hold that back. And we never end up in, in learning how to serve the body of Christ and how God has called us to do it, to serve one another. They will know you are his followers because you serve. In whatever matter that service is, you know the the Bible talks about the gifts in um, in First Corinthians twelve, um, and and a lot of people they like cherish these gifts, but you know a gift is only the extension of His grace. I mean it's not. I, I mean it's given to us in all different measures and portions, and. Um, but, but we don't worship the gifts. We worship the giver. Yes, it's yes. about the giver, not the gift. Yes. And, and, and he does this whole chapter on explaining all these different gifts that is given to the body of Christ for one purpose, to serve each other, whatever that is. And... Um, <laughs> But he concludes that in, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, he concludes it. He says, but covet, covet, covet the more excellent gift. Mm -hmm. Covet that which is excellent. You know, don't look at the individual things, but covet that which is, which is exceeding and excellent. And then he goes into 1 Corinthians 13 and he talks about love. What a gift to covet, mm -hmm. to go after even, even more, you know, because he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way than looking to be fulfilled by a gift. This more excellent way is the walk of the, of, of the believer's life in, in receiving love to be poured out. You know, it's given so you can break, so it can be broken and poured out on the body. Do we know how to serve? Do we know how to serve one another? Um, because service goes beyond the natural. Mm -hmm. There is no serving in the natural. Mm -hmm. It becomes works. Mm -hmm. But genuine service. And... Um, and in, and in think of that, you know, I, I think of Christ's life. I think of, the, of this amazing life um, when he, you know, came down from, uh, he, he came and became man. Um, and we talked about his conditions and everything before. But the Bible is very clear that that ministry, that, that the, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the, um, from the time he was baptized, this earthly ministry and how he fulfilled prophecy in, uh, in, in three areas through, through becoming a, a um, um, through becoming a priest, through becoming a prophet, fulfillment and, and, and becoming a king. And two of those are fully fulfilled and one is yet to come. But they're all eternal. Every one of those are, are eternal. So 
I, I just want to just briefly before I get into this, I just want to go over those because I think it's I think it's such an amazing study to study the life of Christ to study because this is how we become servants to one another. So you think of the priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. And, and this is really, really something. Because it says it was according, according to the priesthood of, of Melchizedek. After, the, after, after Melchizedek. And, and what that means is Melchizedek was a priest that had no beginning and no end. And Christ's priestly ministry, even though it was on earth, has... Had, had never had the beginning, never has no end. But there was a problem with this priestly ministry. Two things that really threw something into it. Uh, and I'm sorry, not a problem. There's never a problem with Christ, you know. But I mean, if you study it, you're, you you could come to the point and say, well, how can this be? And there's two areas. Number one, he wasn't a Levite. And only the Leviticus, only the Levites became priests. And Jesus wasn't a Levite. He was from the tribe of Judah. So that could look at, look at it and say, well, there's your problem. So Christ cannot be the Messiah. Because that's what they point to. And, um, and so, so the priesthood under uh, the Levitical priesthood or under Aaron and, and under his sons. In, um, in Exodus 28. So with Christ, um, there had to be a change in the priesthood. And, I, and, and that could only take place by and through another priest. And, th and this is pretty interesting. Uh, and I believe that that's at his baptism when John baptized him. See, because John's father was a priest, and he was in the Leviticus priesthood. So John could consecrate Christ. And what that means is um, this word concentration was um, from the beginning, from the beginning he would be ordained. From the beginning he would be anointed. And... Um, and there was, there was the, uh, the priest had to be anointed. And I think at Christ's baptism, when you see the, um, when you see the, the dove coming down and, and John saying, boy, I should be baptized by you, but you come to me. And then the key of emphasizing um, this, this priesthood is the voice from heaven this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And at that moment, he was, um, then immediately, the Bible says after that, he was, the spirit took him to the wilderness. You know, so uh, amazing, this, this priesthood. Another thing, it, it had to be at the age of 30. All this had to take place at the age of 30, and that's when, most scholars believe Christ's Christ, uh, ministry started. And if you want to read that, that's in Numbers chapter 4. You can read about that. Numbers 4, verse 3, and Numbers 8, verse 7. So he is a priest. And what a priest. Because the earthly priest, the priest of the Levitical uh, tribe, they um, they they represented the people, but they could not identify with the people. They could never identify with your sin. They can go through the ritual. They can go through the transformation. They can bring even the blood that was accepted by God into the Holy of Holies, but they could never identify with us as sinners. So Christ, not alone, became this amazing high priest that could identify with your sin because he became sin. The sins of the world were put upon Christ on the cross, identifying with you and every single one of your failures. There's not nothing you don't, that, that you do that you don't like about it that God cannot 
identify with perfectly. So not alone he could identify with that sin, but he became sin. So not alone that he would present the blood and be the priest, he would also be the sacrifice. Both, both areas he, he, uh, he would be in. And then there's the prophet. The second thing, the prophet. And, um, you know, when, when, I think of, when I think of this, um, with his um, foretelling and his foretelling. Foretelling means it's past and present. Foretelling is future predictions or coming to pass or fulfillment in, in, in prophecy and scripture. And um, and in the early church under the gifts, there is a there is a list of the prophet, but remember that is all before the book. So do we need a modern day prophet now? Um, I'll talk about this at the wrap. Because, um, because Christ is the last prophet that we need because the fullness of the Bible is right here for us. And, and he, everything is foretold and foretold. He foretells, his, foretells his, his death, his resurrection, his burial, death, resurrection. He, he goes through revelations. He tells you of what things are to come. And then he, he explains how everything in the past was about him. And he uses the Old Testament, which was written to bring us to Christ, to show us Christ as the Messiah. So amazing, um, this prophet. And, and this here, remember, uh, God had to also commission it, and he did that in Matthew 17 on the transfiguration where Christ was changed and another voice from heaven the second time comes down and said this is my beloved son hear him and what are we to do to the prophet what the Old Testament prophet what were they supposed to do hear thus saith the Lord that's who God used as a spokesperson to speak the word and, and, and the people were to hear him. So these amazing commands, these amazing voices that came down from heaven that people heard were, were, were just not words out there saying that, boy, you know, I'm well pleased he's doing such a good job. No, it was the fulfillment of prophecy under his earthly ministry. And then the king, the third one, and and in Christ as the king is, is really a great layout because they tried to make him king as he rode in on a donkey. Not knowing that he had to first, before he became a king, he had to, to pay for the sins of the world. He had to pay for sin. He had to die this death. And one day he will be king. And one day he will be raised up. And, but this kingdom which is laid out, you turn around, uh, Psalms chapter 2 talks about this eternal, the son would be, will have an eternal kingdom. Great chapter, you can read it all. Just, I'm going to just read two verses. Um, verse 5, no, verse 6, and verse 7. Psalms 2, verse 6 and 7, he says, yet, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, and I will declare the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, just like he said before, that you are my son in whom I am well pleased. This is my son, hear him. Now this is my son, this day I have begotten you. They sang this as a song. The king that would be to the end of all time the, the king of kings and the lord of lords, the everlasting king, the eternal, the eternal king. And so this is the, uh, this is just the ministries of Christ and um, just great teaching and understanding that, boy, everything Christ did, he, 
he did for he did for us he did for us so um, let's turn and let's get back what are you doing Joe gosh yeah Tune you down a little. Um, so let's. So I lay this out because it's, it, you know, it, it's it's the body of Christ, and um, and what a plan and what a purpose, what a plan God has for you in your life. But that plan only becomes fully developed within the body of Christ. This is why there's no solo Christianity. Because it's about the body. Amen. And it's about serving the body. Yes. Independent Christianity is serving yourself. And, and, and it makes it so important what the body of Christ is about. In Ephesians chapter 5 starting in verse 1 uh, by, by the way right prior to this chapter he talks about putting on the new man putting off the old and putting on the new it's putting on the new he says one time you used to walk in the vanity of your own thinking it means your mind and your thoughts and your process were all we're all empty. And then, and then it says in verse 5, Ephesians 5, verse 1, it says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children. So, remember when he says, I will always cause you to triumph? That triumph or that victory in your life happens when you follow God. Amen. That's our victory, is following God. And, and we do that because it talks about there because he forgave us. So we follow God as dear children. Verse 2, and walk in love. So if we're walking in love, we're following God. If we're following God, we're walking in love. It just just overlaps each other. As Christ has loved you, our, our, our Christian walk, our Christian walk, he's defining our Christian walk to be a follower of God. Paul said, be an imitator of me as I imitate Christ. Imitate, following God, walking after God. What are we walking after? Do we have all these things that we want to accomplish in life? They're getting in the way of our walk. <laughs> and I'm not saying not to have goals and things like that for your family and your life. But I wouldn't want to pursue any of that without following God. Or walking with God. Or walking in love. Or walking with Christ. Look at this. And walk in love, in verse 2, as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice of God for a sweet-smelling savor. A sweet-smelling savor, a, a sacrifice. Christ gave himself as this sacrifice. He was poured out. He was poured out and he became this sweet savior, this, this amazing sacrifice, this amazing fragrance. He was broken for us, a, a, a sweet savor, an amazing sacrifice for us as an offering, as an offering. And we remember we dissected those ingredients last week and how they came from all different areas, but they came together. You know, God says, you're going to go to Arabia and get this. You're going to go to India and get this. And you're going to bring it all back. And you're going to take an even, even measurement of each one of them. And then you're going to mix them together. And, and this is the body of Christ. Where we all come together and we mix them together. 
and that as the body and as individuals, then we put it through the fire. And that's so important. I mean, we go through the fire. The ingredients must be broken down from its original compound, and we too must be broken down from our old sin nature and, and, and broken and, and crushed and poured out to be able to be a servant. One purpose, that you serve the body, that you serve and you love one another. What a breakdown. And, and, and through the fire, well, I don't want to go through that fire. I don't want to go through that. You know? And Peter 1.7 says, boy, the trials of your faith that, that are put through this, this, this fire of life. You know, that reduces us to nothing. But it's not over because what is used then is used um, at the altar, at the place of sacrifice. Because when we go to the cross, we see Christ and we become broken in our, in our spirit, hopefully. And if you haven't, you know, get a picture of that. Get a picture of Christ. Get a picture of that sacrifice. Get a picture of that resurrection in your life. Walk with God. Walk with Him. Walk with Christ. Experience the fragrance of Christ. And Ephesians 4.20 says, You have not so learned Christ. We need to start learning Him. Not knowing him from, from a standpoint where an acquaintance, but experiencing the living Christ, walking with God. The Bible says, Enoch walked with God and was no more. That's what we want from our flesh. Walk with God and your flesh will be no more. And, and you can be poured out to be used by God in such a great capacity. You don't know the people that you can reach when you allow the fragrance to come out. Forget the bottle. Forget the alabaster box. It's the fragrance. People need the fragrance within you. They need Christ within you. One, one last thing this morning. Turn to John chapter 8. I was talking to Pastor Keith Wednesday about a message from Dr. Stevens, but I could never find it. And, um, and I just started praying you know, to help me find it. And, and God led me to this. He goes, you find it here. Don't listen to the message. Listen to it. So it was really, really incredible. And, and God gave me something. This wasn't in the message. I'll try to find that message. It's called Lines in the Sand. And um, I'll, I'll try to find that so you can listen because it's amazing, but I want to show you what God gave me on this. So, um, so this is the story of a woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And they brought her to Jesus. How the man went free, I don't know. They only brought the woman. And they placed her in the midst. Eight four. And then you just follow. And they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And now Moses, guys, please quiet. Very important. And they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in the doctrine of the very act. And Moses in the law commands us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? And they were tempting him that they might accuse him. And Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote in the ground 
as though he heard them not. And that, that's not in the original, but that's the meaning of what's going on. Because when, when somebody doesn't address you, if you ask somebody a question they don't answer, you, you automatically picture, well, maybe you didn't hear me. Let's, let me clarify this. But this was on purpose. In verse 7, and, and when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And then again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they left basically one by one. And when, um, and then when he looked up, he found no one was there but the woman. Now, I think if, if if this was me, or think of the woman part, I mean, when everybody else is leaving, wouldn't you like to get out of there too? Wouldn't you try to run away? Because now you're in front of Christ with, with him having a, um, <laughs> him having heard whether it's true or not. And thank God Christ doesn't judge on what he heard. You know, a lot of us, we say a lot of things to each other. We, we, we've got to stop. We don't expose other people. We don't expose other people. We don't judge people according to the flesh. And, um, but she stood there and to me, I, I believe at that moment she received a repentance heart. Um, you know, to believe and and to hear what Christ would say to her personally and individually. And I think about him writing on the ground, and this isn't, I don't think this is hard ground. I think this is more of sand. And, um, and, I, and, and just for illustration purposes, you know, and everybody wants to come out and say what he was writing. And I've heard, I've heard over 10 different things of what Jesus was writing here, but it doesn't say what he's writing here. Oh, he was writing their names. Really? Where, where is that? I don't see that. You know, and again, that's not the point. The point is not, I mean, and we always want to know what is not written. And, and we rush over what is written. <laughs> you know, what is written stimulates our conversation, and what, it, what is not written stimulates our conversation, and what is written we don't even want to talk about. I mean, let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about what's here. And, you know, thinking of this just, just as a picture, just as a picture, um, I think he was just drawing lines, you know. And you know, all of us have lines in our soul, and these are areas of our lives where we have great trauma, and great setback, and great struggle, and great condemnation, and and great great guilt. Guilt guilt cripples us. It cripples the believer. We can't even take a step of faith because we have so much guilt upon our soul. And we know the verses and we know the scriptures, but it never penetrates past the lines. The lines are like a barrier. These lines in the sands are barriers. We can't even penetrate it. And we can get a good word and we can get set free and we can get delivered. And three days later, my, my old sin nature, my old flesh it is now drilling my mind and bringing up my past again. Those are lines in the sand. Those are areas in our lives that, that are strongholds, the Bible calls them. And, and it cripples the believer to even to the point and to the extent where we cannot even serve one another. It stops our serving. Old, old habits, old addictions, all things from the flesh before you became new. 
we continue to participate. Lines in the sand. Line after line after line. And, and, and you know what? I think when I think when Christ speaks to this woman, I think the first time he's making lines. And I think the second time as he's drawing, he's like getting rid of them. Because, you know, just with sand, I mean, you can do sand and you can just wipe your hand over it or even pour water on it and it's gone. And, 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 and you know what? This is how powerful Christ's words are when he says, neither do I condemn thee. The one that could condemn her said, I don't condemn thee. There's nothing about your past for me to condemn. It's just lines in the sand. They're not real. They can be easily washed away and easily re re erased. But you continue to live in them. You continue to be hindered by them. They, they halt you. I, I, I believe when, when um, um, uh, Peter says, uh, and Paul, he says, you, you guys should be you guys should be teachers by now. But yet you're still babies because you want to hold on to your past. You're not living in Christian values. You're not walking with God. You're not hearing from the Spirit. You're living in the lines. All the things from your past, boy, it got quiet in here. Huh? It, it, it's powerful. It's powerful. It's powerful. We want, we want us to, you know, this woman went away justified. Went away set free. And then he says to her, what? Now go and sin no more. He had to say no condemnation first. Because without hearing in our lives no condemnation, we don't have a capacity to not sin. Because it's our, our, our flesh. The flesh is going to sin. And when we sin, remember, it doesn't mean we're not going to sin. And when we sin, we have an advocate. Amen. But we're talking about habitually living in the same effects over and over that cripples your Christian walk. Mm -hmm. Lines in the soul. Areas of our soul that Christ wants to heal. He tells you, you are healed. You are forgiven. No condemnation. There's no condemnation. You're set free. You got victory. You're, you can walk triumphant in Christ. Walk with him now. Go with him now. Walk in love and serve the body. I think, I think the greatest part of Christian ministry is learning to serve one another. But we need to be broken so the fragrance can be released. This woman was set free that day and nobody could, could nobody could condemn her and I love when Jesus dealt with others go but you know you're worried about what others are saying about you where are they now where did all your accusers go when they stand before God when you stand before Christ nobody will be coming and accusing you it's just you and God and he says neither do I Neither, what great words that we need to hear. Neither do I. Don't allow your past to, to stop you. Our identity, and we heard, me and Cindy heard that this week, our identity is not in, uh, not, in, um, it, uh, not in our experiences. My, my experiences and my past are not my identity. It's not from the new creation. That's why before he says to walk with God and walk in love, he says, put on, put on Christ, put on Christ. This is what he's done for us. So let the, let the sand, let the lines in the sand be washed away today. Receive no condemnation in your life. Walk in victory. Walk with God. Walk in love. Walk in the spirit. Walk in the fullness of what God has given you. Every day he gives you his love. Every day he tells you no 
condemnation. Now walk with me. Amen? Amen. Pray for Amen. God. Thank you, Father. Lord, we love you this day. We thank you. Lord, we know that... Um, we know that we live in hindrances and setbacks and depressions and guilt and, and all these things that come against us every single day, and, and many of them haunt me, Lord. And um, let us just keep hearing no condemnation, no condemnation, no condemn. You will never be condemned. Christ has given you victory. Christ has set you free. Lord, bless the, the offering and bless our wrath in our fellowship, and, um, and just bring questions, Lord, and let us serve one another in love. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Mm -hmm.